Weezer is a band that probably shouldn't exist, or at least shouldn't be as popular as they are. From their frontman's unique origins in a like niche Buddhist community to them just trying their best to completely alienate the fan base they built and torpedo the crazy success that they found with their debut album, Weezer never did things the way that they were expected to do them. But this is the story of how they defined a cultural moment anyway. This video was requested by several users a while ago, months ago, so hopefully they're still around and keep suggesting bands you want me to cover in the comments. I'll add them to the list, and if more people want them, then I'll prioritize it. Rivers Cuomo was born in 1970 in Manhattan and right off the bat caused controversy because accounts vary on how he got his name. His mother, Beverly Schoenberger, said that she came up with the name because she heard a river outside of the hospital window after Rivers was born. He's also in Manhattan in between two rivers, so probably played some role. But his father, Frank Cuomo, who was the son of Italian immigrants and worked as a cow farmer, said that he was named Rivers after three stars of the 1970 World Cup, who all had River or Riva as part of their names. Frank actually missed Rivers' birth because he was at home watching the World Cup games, so it's not as far-fetched as it might originally sound. Frank not being the best father is kind of a recurring theme in this story. Rivers wasn't given a middle name because his parents wanted him to choose his own, which is something he never got around to doing. The next year, his mother gave birth to another son named Leaves. He was supposed to be born in October, when the leaves would be changing, and that's probably the origin of the name, but he was premature and came in August. Pretty soon after Rivers was born, the family moved kind of further upstate to the Rochester Zen Center, which was established in 1966, making it one of the oldest and largest Buddhist Zen centers in the United States. They lived there until Frank left the family in 1975, which is when Beverly decided to move the family to Yogaville, which sounds like a made-up place, but it's very much not. I mean, no more than any other place. Everything's made up. Rivers was known as a pretty somber kid, and to be considered mellow in a place called Yogaville, it seems like a pretty big feat. Rivers said, quote, My teacher asked my mother what was wrong with me because I'd never looked happy. So my mother advised her to say, let me see that smile, and then I would smile. So she did that in front of the whole class. She got the whole class to turn around, look at me, and say, let me see that smile. End quote. As an introvert, that is my worst nightmare. Rivers spent a lot of his early life engaging with the daily practice of meditation, which is something that he would continue throughout his career. He dealt with a lot of anxiety and insecurity, so that practice of meditation helped center him and focus him. In 1977, Rivers was introduced to something that would completely change his life. The album Rock and Roll Over by Kiss. As he was growing up, Rivers listened to the kind of music that his parents liked, stuff like Cat Stevens and the Beatles, you know, how we all did. We were just listening to what our parents decided to play on the radio. And while he appreciated that music, those songs never really sunk their teeth into him. But then, Rivers said, quote, This little girl came through the ashram for a visit, and she brought a Kiss record, Rock and Roll Over. She came over to our house, and while we played the Kiss record, we recorded ourselves running around in circles as the tape played. Hearing that album quite literally changed his life. He fell in love with Kiss and just rock and roll guitar in general. Pretty soon, he joined the Columbia Record Club, and I think the idea behind that was it was kind of like a membership thing where you pay a penny per record. I don't know. Let me know in the comments what exactly that was. I couldn't find too much information about it, but somehow he used the Columbia Record Club to get all of Kiss's records, but he also branched out a little bit and started getting records from people like ABBA and Queen. In 1980, Yoga Yogaville decided to relocate to Virginia, but the Cuomo family wanted to stay in Connecticut, which meant that Rivers and Leaves were now going to be in public school. If you think that thrusting two young boys who grew up in hippie Buddhist communities straight into public school with no preparation is a bad idea, you'd be right. Rivers said that he and Leaves got the crap beaten out of them several times when they went into public school. They did their best to mitigate it, though. They taught each other cuss words so that they could fit in better, and they even changed their names. Leaves became James Kitts. I think Kitts was their stepfather's last name, 
and Rivers became Peter Kitts, mostly because it sounded like Peter Chris, who was in the band Kiss. Part of the reason that Rivers was bullied so heavily is because he was a nerd back in the era when that wasn't a cool thing to be. He loved Dungeons and Dragons and comic books and Star Wars and all of the things that people are free to love without shame today. But that wasn't the case in the 80s. Rivers took quite a bit of abuse because of this passion for these kind of nerdy things. And since he was a really shy and introverted kid, music became kind of his only outlet from that. He also met Justin Fisher, who became his best friend, and the two of them had a lot of the same interest and kind of like helped each other through a lot of that stuff. One day, Rivers and James watched some classmates perform a Quiet Riot song as part of an eighth grade talent show, and Rivers was kind of confused about it because he knew those kids who were playing and he knew they were just regular guys that never really got any attention. But when they were on stage playing that song, people flocked to him and were like super enraptured by it. And that sparked something in Rivers. So obviously Rivers and James decided to start a band. The only problem with that was they didn't know how to play any instruments and Rivers didn't even own a guitar at that point didn't stop him from starting a band that they named Fury. In June of 1984, Rivers did convince his parents to buy him a guitar as a present, and then he quickly started teaching himself how to play it by just kind of copying riffs that he heard on metal records. He said that he would learn how to play those solos and riffs and then play them for his mom, and he said, quote, I'd play her the Shock Me solo from Alive 2 because I thought that was the greatest. She told me that it sounded like a dying cat, end quote. A few days after he got his first guitar, Fury, which was Rivers, Justin, Leaves, and their friend Eric Robertson, started rehearsing, and I'm sure it sounded phenomenal. They played their first show in September of 1984. Also in high school, Rivers discovered heavy metal, and he called it the music of his generation. He even took a Quiet Riot album into a hairdresser so that they could make his hair look like that band. A year after forming Fury, Rivers and James formed another band that they called Avant Garde. Rivers took this band really seriously. He even started taking guitar lessons, but the rest of the members would kind of like float in and out. They, I mean, they were high school students. They're not taking it as seriously as Rivers is at this point. After complaining to his Zen master about how hard high school was for him and getting some advice from that Zen master to the effect of real life is hard to find something that you're passionate about and focus on that, Rivers decided that he was going to actually give it a go and try and become a rock star because that's what he saw himself loving and the only thing he could really envision himself doing for the rest of his life. In high school, as well as loving metal music and rock music, he he also did a lot of musical theater and was in barbershop quartets, so just immersing himself in this more melodic music. Rivers had a decent amount of friends around him that kind of gravitated towards him and that shared similar interests. He was seen as kind of like the king of the outcast, but he had kind of an antisocial streak. He was shy and introverted, and he preferred spending his time alone in his room writing songs and practicing the guitar. Also, towards the end of his high school career, his mom was going through another divorce, so I'm sure things at home weren't exactly the most stable. After high school, Rivers attended a five-week summer program at the Berklee School of Music, and after that, in 1989, he moved to Los Angeles. The music scene, at least of the 80s, was very centered on Los Angeles and the West Coast. But by 1989, that hair metal scene that Rivers kind of fell in love with was starting to die out. But I'm sure being where that scene really flourished and found its legs still had a massive appeal for Rivers. While in LA, Rivers started taking classes at the Guitar Institute, but he wasn't actually going to the classes, so he was told he wasn't going to graduate. He was also still working with his band Avant Garde. They had moved out there together, but they renamed it Zoom because it was more marketable. And then he started working at Tower Records, which he kind of cites as a defining moment in his life, something that changed the course of his career. Because by working at Tower Records, he was introduced to some of these new bands that were coming out, like Pixies and Nirvana. And those bands blew his mind. By 1990, Zoom had kind of fizzled out because... Rivers had grown tired of heavy metal and he was more focused on this alternative rock music that he was hearing. Rivers said about leaving metal behind, quote, Metal didn't seem very relevant anymore, so I locked myself away with an acoustic guitar and started writing my own songs, end quote. Also at Tower Records, Rivers met a guy named Pat Finn, and then he met Pat's roommate, 
Patrick Wilson. Patrick Wilson grew up in Buffalo and fell in love with music really early on. He said the first record he purchased was by Barry Manilow. But he soon moved beyond that and started listening to bands like Van Halen. After seeing Van Halen on his 15th birthday, he started taking drum lessons, and by the time he was a senior in high school, he was good enough at drums to start teaching it to people. I think by the time he graduated, he had something like 30 students that he was teaching. He pretty quickly found out that college wasn't for him. He said, quote, college is great if you want to learn, but that's not what college is about. It's about making your professor happy and getting good grades and getting into IBM. Any place that says that they're only accepting college graduates is not a place I'm very interested in being. End quote. So instead, he started working at a music store called Music Mart and still teaching drumming on the side. And it was at Music Mart that Patrick Wilson met Pat Finn. Pat Finn was just back in town after attending the Musicians Institute in L.A. I've, I've never been to Buffalo, but I can't imagine it shares many similarities with L.A. So Pat Finn was really ready to get out of Buffalo and head back to the West Coast. And he managed to convince Patrick Wilson to go with him. Pat told Patrick all about the music scene in L.A. And Patrick, who was really most motivated to get his own musical career off the ground, kind of understood that his prospects in Buffalo were very limited. So with no money and no real plan, the two of them packed up and moved to Los Angeles. Once in LA, Patrick Wilson joined Pat's band, which was called Bush, no relation to the actually successful band named Bush, which is where he first started playing with a guy named Matt Sharp. Patrick said, quote, By the time I had met Matt Sharp and we were trying to figure out something to do, we had a lot of passion and interest in certain kinds of music, but we didn't know how that was going to translate into what we were going to do, end quote. Matt Sharp was born in Thailand in 1969 during the Vietnam War. His father was contracted by the U.S. government to interview prisoners of war, but when Matt was one, his family moved back to the States and settled in Arlington, Virginia. As a teenager, he got really into punk music, and that convinced him that the music scene in Arlington kind of sucked, so he made up his mind to move out west. But since he was 14 at the time, that was kind of difficult, but he managed to do it, and by the time he was 16, he was living in San Diego and playing in a kind of goth band called The Click. But then he met Pat Finn and started playing keyboards in Bush. The timeline kind of gets a little bit messy here because the four of them and then a couple of their other friends are kind of like merging around and working on bands with each other and separately all around the same time and kind of gets a little bit hard to parse through who's doing what and where. But after meeting Pat Finn and then being introduced to Patrick Wilson and Matt Sharp, Rivers Cuomo started living with Patrick Wilson and Matt Sharp and working together. And soon, Rivers, Pat Finn, and Patrick Wilson started a band called 60 Wrong Sausages. They came up with that name because they were working on a song called The Wrong Sausage, and one of them said, quote, It can't be about just one incorrect sausage. So it became about 60. That band really didn't last all that long. They only played one show together, but through it, Rivers and Patrick Wilson learned that they really loved working on songs together. And that was a very important thing for them to discover. His friend and co-wrong sausage, Jason Cropper, said that Rivers was getting much better at songwriting. He'd hear songs on the radio like Smells Like Teen Spirit and get really frustrated because he was like, I should have written that. Even though a lot of the technical aspects of it carried over, he had kind of left his heavy metal roots and was really invested in the alternative rock scene. After 60 Wrong Sausages, Rivers stepped back from being in a band and performing so he could really focus in on writing songs. He said he didn't want to get back into another group until he had a batch of songs that he thought were really good. So he and Patrick Wilson got writing. Rivers said, quote, So I just wrote songs and didn't play at all for a long time. Undone, Jonas, Only in Dreams, and The World Has Turned and Left Me Here were all written before we even played together. End quote. They also recorded some little demos, and Patrick loved those songs so much that he brought that demo to Matt Sharp. Matt Sharp also thought they were really good, so he moved back to LA in order to be a part of whatever was going to come out of this. On February 14th, 1992, that unnamed project had their first rehearsal, and right away they knew that they had stumbled on something really good. Rivers said, quote, when we first started practicing, I mean from our very first rehearsal, I thought to myself, we're amazing. This is incredible. Everybody's going to love us, end quote. At that time, the band was Rivers, Jason Cropper on guitar, Matt Sharp on bass, and Patrick Wilson on drums. They played their first show on March 19th, 1992, closing for Keanu Reeves' band, which is absurd like the idea of a closing band is just kind of absurd to me like no one's going to stick around for that which ended up being the case when they closed for Keanu Reeves band when they booked that gig they still didn't have a name so when the club asked them who are you guys 
They kind of battered around a few different names, couldn't find anything they liked. So Rivers just decided on the name Weezer, which is a name that meant nothing to three of them. But Weezer was something that Rivers' dad used to call him as a kid. Rivers said that he doesn't really know where the name came from, but his dad claims it was the name of the coolest little rascal. So that's why he started calling him Weezer. Despite how good Rivers and the rest of the band thought they were, they really struggled in the early days. No one was coming out to the shows. Rivers said, quote, We would always be last slot on the bill at 1 a.m. when everyone was leaving, so we had really low self-esteem, end quote. After about nine months, they were really exhausted and really tired of trying to do it themselves and getting nowhere. Throughout all of this, Rivers had still been attending community college, so when he was offered a really great scholarship at UC Berkeley, it even included, like, an apartment and a parking spot, he was really considering taking it and leaving the band life behind. Matt Sharp had become the de facto manager of Weezer, so Rivers went to him and basically said, we've got a year to get signed or else I'm dropping this and going to UC Berkeley. During that year, on August 12th, 1992, the band recorded a demo tape at the Amherst house, which was their home base and frequent rehearsal space. They called it the kitchen tape, and it was their first serious attempt at making and recording their songs. For months, they shopped it around and got nowhere, so a few months later, in November, they recorded another demo tape, and they had to pay the engineer with a set of speakers. Fans called this tape the real demo. Finally, in 1993, the kitchen tape caught the attention of Tom Sullivan with Geffen Records. They also opened for a band called Sloan, who were one of Geffen's bands, so that show put them in front of several different Geffen executives, who invited the guys to a meeting where Matt Sharp did most of the talking because he was the band's manager. They talked about what kind of music Weezer hoped to make and how Geffen could partner with them in that. Despite other people at Geffen questioning his judgment, Tom signed Weezer to their first deal on June 25th, 1993. Right after signing, Rivers started to doubt if that's what he really wanted. Of course, he was excited to finally have a deal and finally be making some inroads, but I think this was the first instance of his insecurity and self-doubt kind of taking over a little bit. Weezer really wanted to self-produce their first album, but Geffen, kind of understandably, said no. So the band kind of jokingly suggested Rick Okasek, since they loved his band The Cars. It very quickly became not a joke, and Weezer flew off to New York to record a practice demo with Rick. That test went well, Rick hit it off with all the guys, especially Rivers, and the band got ready to start recording their debut album. As they were nearing the ending of that recording, Rivers fired Jason Cropper. Since Jason left on pretty negative terms, and there's a lot of legal paperwork involved, it's kind of hard to know exactly what happened. But Jason's girlfriend had gotten pregnant, and it's speculated that he, as well as the rest of the band, were pretty concerned about her health during that pregnancy. So some people say that he left the band in order to go take care of her. But there's also the idea that Rivers knew, with the band recording their debut album for a major label, they all needed to be 100% focused on the songs and the recording, and the band with a new child coming and with Jason acting a little bit more erratic since he learned about the pregnancy Rivers felt that he wouldn't be able to give 100% to the band so they needed to move on from him but whatever the actual reason Jason is out of the band and Rivers re-recorded all of his guitar parts in about a day to replace Jason they called a guy named Brian Bell they had played a gig with one of Brian's bands before so they knew they liked his sound Brian was born in 1968 in Iowa City his mom was an assistant principal at an elementary school and his dad taught geography at the University of Tennessee when he was four his parents took him to see Elvis in Knoxville which ignited his passion for music his mom wouldn't let him take guitar lessons until high school because she didn't believe he would actually practice so he started on piano before before eventually picking up the guitar. When he turned 18, he moved out to Los Angeles and started taking classes at the Guitar Institute of Technology, and he joined a band called Carnival Art. It was like an alt-rock band, and they released quite a lot of stuff through 1993, but no one bought any of it, so they were dropped by their label. It was while Carnival Art was in this process of being dropped by their label that Brian first met the guys in Weezer. He said, quote, They started playing on the scene, and I instantly saw something unique in them. I didn't necessarily want to be in their band. They, for some reason, were in with the wrong crowd and playing at the wrong venues. I wanted to help them out any way I could, and I wanted to play a show with them. End quote. One night while he was driving home, Brian made the mental decision to fully quit Carnival Art, a band that he thought was going nowhere. So 
with that decision having been made, he got home and there was a message on his answering machine from Matt Sharp. So he called Matt back, and that's when Matt and Rivers asked Brian to join Weezer, and he very excitedly accepted. His excitement and new ideas helped breathe a lot of life into a very nervous Weezer. Weezer's self-titled debut album, which people call the Blue Album, was released in May of 1994. The single Undone the Sweater Song, which Rivers described as, quote, the feeling you get when the train stops and the little guy comes knocking on your door. It was supposed to be a sad song, but everyone thinks it's hilarious, end quote. The Sweater Song started to get some radio play, and then Spike Jones directed a music video for it, which became an instant hit on MTV and that is a major factor at this point in time. If you get your music video into heavy rotation on MTV, you are destined to have a hit song. Rivers talked about writing the sweater song. He said he started writing it when he first got to LA and was exposed to all of this new exciting music like Sonic Youth and Pixies and the Velvet Underground. He said, quote, I was like, okay, I'm going to try and write a Velvet Underground song. I sat down and came up with the sweater song riff. End quote. He was originally really happy with it, but it didn't occur to him until much later that it sounded almost exactly like a Metallica song. After another Spike Jones directed music video for the song Buddy Holly, the Blue Album became a massive hit, but that was when Rivers started to doubt everything. He said, quote, A lot of bands tried their best to make it, and when they finally made it, they became very miserable and felt like this was the last thing they wanted. End quote and he implied that that was very much his feeling after the success of the Blue Album. He have also felt a lot of insecurity because he couldn't figure out if it was the songs and his songwriting that people connected with, or if people just really liked the Spike Jones music videos. Plus, the style of the Buddy Holly music video wasn't really what they were going for. They were trying to be a serious rock and roll band, and because of the Buddy Holly sound and the Buddy Holly music video, people started to look at them as more of like a gimmicky kind of thing. Rivers kind of had this very one-way rivalry with Kurt Cobain, and he thought that people were going to see Weezer as the next Nirvana. He said that he thought people were going to perceive Weezer as, quote, a super important, super powerful, heartbreaking, heavy rock band, and a serious artist, which isn't what happened after the Blue Album. So with the Blue Album being perceived in a way that Rivers wasn't happy with, and with Rivers getting exhausted with the monotony of touring, he decided to rapidly change direction and try to be a more classical musician. He said that what really started to wear on him was just the drudgery of touring, of playing the same songs night after night and packing and unpacking. And just the touring life is very draining. So after a year of doing that in support of the Blue Album, he took a step back and decided to go back to college. He failed to get into Juilliard and then enrolled in Harvard, which isn't a bad fallback school. Apparently the band was playing a show in Boston and he just went to Harvard and applied and they accepted him, which hearing that probably makes a lot of people very upset. He said he wanted to go back to school because he felt like he was wasting his brain. It was also probably nice to just step out of that rock star persona for a bit because he said that people at Harvard just didn't know him. He said their audience at that point was much younger than college age people and even the college students who knew him didn't recognize him. He also said he like grew out a beard and just kind of looked like an older guy and not necessarily the Weezer frontman. He said that he'd be like on the bus with people wearing Weezer shirts and they didn't know that it was him. During this bit of a hiatus, the members of Weezer all started to explore different side projects. Matt formed a group called The Rentals and Patrick started his own side project. Meanwhile, Rivers was starting to get more and more frustrated and lonely at Harvard. He suffered from writer's block and deep insecurity. When he received a letter from a Japanese fan, he became kind of weirdly obsessed with it and that unlocked the themes for the next Weezer album. So the second album, called Pinkerton, was released in September of 1996, and it had some mixed results, to put it mildly. It felt like it was aimed at alienating that mainstream audience that only knew Weezer from Buddy Holly. It was darker and more melancholic, really leaning into what Rivers was feeling at Harvard. Fans and critics 
really didn't like it when it first came out. Rivers explained his feelings towards Pinkerton when he said, quote, It's like getting really drunk at a party and spilling your guts in front of everyone and feeling incredibly great and cathartic about it, and then waking up the next morning and realizing what a complete fool you made of yourself, end quote. It's worth noting that now Pinkerton has a very dedicated and loyal fan base. It's kind of seen as like a prototype for the emerging emo movement, and fans and a lot of critics have done a complete 180 on it, and it's a lot of people's favorite Weezer album, including some of my subscribers. I mentioned that I was doing a Weezer video and people talked about how much they loved Pinkerton, so it has a whole new life now, but at the time, very poorly received. After Pinkerton commercially failed, the band went on hiatus to work on other projects. And really, that should kind of be the end of the Weezer story. They had one successful album and then torched their own fan base. They had a frontman and creative leader who really wasn't feeling it anymore. They all had their own side projects, and it seemed like, at least on the surface, they were more excited about those side projects than Weezer. There was really no reason to believe that Weezer could be resurrected and become even more successful than they already were. During this hiatus, Rivers moved back to Boston to keep attending Harvard and suffered from pretty deep depression, even at one point like blacking out his windows. But he was also working on other projects like a band called Homey and another one called Lovely. Patrick Wilson recorded a solo album that went unreleased, and he started working on a band called Special Goodness. Brian Bell was really focused on his side project called Space Twins, and in 1998, Matt Sharp officially left Weezer in order to give his full focus on his band The Rentals. It appeared to be a pretty amical split between Matt and Weezer, at least until... 2002 when Matt sued the band. He claimed that he co-wrote most of the songs in Blue and was entitled to a bigger interest in them than he was currently getting. He told MTV, quote, I found out some things recently about their actions that really changed the whole thing and all in all really broke my heart. They left me no choice than to have to deal with it in this way, end quote. After they settled out of court, he moved to a small town outside of Nashville and kind of stepped back from the music scene, taking a few years off before reforming the rentals and working on some solo stuff. The vibe still wasn't quite right when the band reconvened in Los Angeles to start trying to work on a follow-up to Pinkerton. Rivers left those rehearsals and went back to Boston, where he bumped into Mikey Welsh. Mikey was originally from Syracuse, but he made his name playing in Boston area bands like Heretics. He also played with Patrick Wilson's project, The Special Goodness, but I think that was after he had already been in Weezer. He first met Rivers at a show in Boston, and when Rivers came into the show, he was kind of like trying to play it cool and not freak out, and then Rivers came over to his table and asked, are you Mikey Welsh the bassist? Apparently, the Mighty Mighty Boss Tones told Rivers that there was this guy in Boston named Mikey that he should get to know and they should work together because their styles would really mesh. So they started hanging out and jamming together, and he felt like a natural replacement for Matt. With Mikey Welsh in the band, they started trying to record, but it, something wasn't gelling. It wasn't working the way it used to, and they needed a way to get back into the swing of things. So they created a pseudonym called Goat Punishment and used that name to play some small club dates around the West Coast. It was an attempt to just kind of like get their mojo back and play together again without the pressure of playing as Weezer. But didn't really work, and in the spring of 1999, they went on hiatus again. Rivers used this time to really dig in deep into songwriting. He created almost this formulaic approach to understanding what made a good pop song, and he did that by breaking down and analyzing the songs that he loved. By the end of 1999, he had written 121 new songs. In April of 2000, they accepted a pretty lucrative deal to play the Fuji Rock Festival, so they got back together. And then in December, they were back in the studio to work on what would become the Green Album. They once again worked with Rick as the producer, but this time in Los Angeles. They focused on simpler songs that were much less personal. I think after Pinkerton, Rivers might have been a little bit afraid to put himself out there as much. The album was much more successful, and it got significant airplay on MTV, which introduced a whole new generation of fans to Weezer. But soon after this, Mikey Welsh left the band, and there's still a little bit of confusion as to what actually happened there. All we know for sure is that he was hospitalized, and it feels kind of wrong to speculate much further on what might have been going on. We know that he suffered a lot from depression, so 
Uh, make of that what you will. But we also know that he felt very betrayed by Rivers after this whole thing went down, and it took the two quite a while to actually make up. So Mikey was replaced by Scott Schreiner. Scott was from Toledo, Ohio, and started playing bass in high school. He formed several bands in high school before relocating to Los Angeles in 1989. With Scott in the band, they drifted into a more hard rock sound with their next album called Maladroit, which was released in May of 2002. It didn't do all that well commercially, but critics seem to really love it. Before they started working on their next album, Rivers became even more obsessive about songwriting, if that was even possible. He dug in deep to that kind of like formulaic approach. He even had a binder breaking down his philosophy of songwriting and what he felt made a good pop song. Before they went to record the next album, he had written 350 songs or something crazy like that, and most of them were like ready to be recorded by the time they got to the studio, which... It's kind of weird for bands. Normally they would work through things in the studio. It was just a really analytical, almost scientific approach to writing a pop song. And the resulting album called Make Believe was their highest charting album to date. So I guess it worked. But a lot of critics really hated it. They thought that that formulaic approach to songwriting took a lot of the personality out of the band. After releasing Make Believe, Rivers returned to Harvard and finished his degree in English in 2006. He had been attending Harvard on and off for like 11 years by that point. Brian started a new project called The Relationship, and Patrick kept working on Special Goodness. Rivers got married to Kiyoko Ito, which was a wedding attended by both Matt Sharp and Jason Cropper. So... Seems like there was at least some reconciliation there. And while he was on his honeymoon, Rivers did an interview with MTV that seemed to at least imply that Weezer was broken up. He said, quote, Really, for the moment, we are done. And I'm not certain we'll ever make a record again unless it becomes really obvious to me that we need to do one, end quote. But Rivers later said that he was mostly just annoyed that he had to do an interview on his honeymoon, and that probably impacted the answers he gave. They did end up returning with the Red Album, released in 2008, which was produced by Rick Rubin and was pretty experimental. It featured longer and more involved songs than people were used to hearing from Weezer. I've been trying to think of a way to end this video, and I can't really think of a good way to do it, so I've decided to just do it in a bad way and end it here. As I'm sure we all know, Weezer is still out there. They've released a ton more albums since the Red Album. They're still making music, still playing shows. But around the time that Make Believe was released, the band kind of entered a new era. A lot of fans really want them to go back to that Pinkerton style, the more introspective personal style, but they're very much in a time now where their songs kind of feel more formulaic and dare I say, generic. That transition started with Make Believe, and I think it's fully realized now. So it feels like a good time to kind of like cap this episode and talk about the first era of Weezer, and now we're very much in this kind of new style. If you want me to make a video on the new style and talk about a lot of the newer albums, let me know. I'd be interested in digging more into that. I think it's an era of the band that hasn't really been talked about a lot. People mostly focus on the early stuff, so could be interesting to get like a Weezer part two and look at some of that stuff, but who knows where Weezer goes next? Maybe there's a whole new era coming soon that'll be more like Pinkerton. I'm sure a lot of people would really love that. Anyway, that's Weezer, at least part of Weezer. Let me know what you thought by using the comments below. Like the video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more stories from music history.